Hi, and welcome back. I'm up here inside the cozy cabin of our Pacific Sea Craft Orion 27, here on the icy hard in Colorado. I'm very grateful to have this heater going while I'm doing indoor boat projects. In this video, we'll cover briefly off-grid heating options, pros and cons, and we'll get into figuring out where to install it, and then finally installing this Dickinson SIG 100 diesel heater. Now I found out just after finishing this video that, or near the end, that Dickinson no longer makes the SIG 100. Um, I hope that someday in the future they get back into it because this is one of the smallest heaters on the market and for a small boat like this, an Orion 27, it's nice not having something too big. Now in this video I'll sometimes use a somewhat confusing nomenclature. Sometimes I'll be talking about a diesel heater and sometimes a diesel stove. And uh, often we think of wood stoves and not wood heaters and we think of the cooking appliance as a stove. Anyway, uh, thanks for putting up with that confusing nomenclature, but here we go. For those of you new to off-grid heating for small boats, you'll find there are several options available. Electric heating is a great and convenient option when you're on shore power, but not when you're off-grid, other than briefly due to the high amount of power needed. There are several things to consider when deciding what kind of heat and stove are best for you. Much of it relates back to the fuel type. How hard will it be to replenish the fuel? And what are the costs? That'll depend upon where you are, where you're traveling, where you stay. You'll need also to figure out where to store fuel and safely handle it. Consider what effort you need to operate the stove and maintain the heat output. Common maintenance and repairs of the stove also need to be considered. And then there's a need for electricity. Well, that's another consideration, such as for fan-assisted draft or a fuel pump. Then what about the stove? What size? What kind of BTU output does it need? Then what kind of heating? Larger boats would benefit more from hydronic or forced air heat to reach the outer areas of the boat, but all that needs power and the power can be a high demand. And then regarding cost, well, new stoves with accessories typically start at around a thousand bucks. Solid fuels like wood, coal, or charcoal I think are messy, both regarding the fuel, handling ash, and chimney soot, because the burn, the chimney soot accumulates because the burn's not very efficient. And there's a lot of soot stains that can get all over the deck and nearby things like the mast, boom, and sails. Although the fuel is not volatile, it does take up a lot of space, but it may be the easiest of fuels for you to restock, and it's typically the cheapest, and often you could find it for free. Having a lot of experience using wood stoves to heat homes I've lived in, I know that maintaining steady heat requires frequent restoking of the fire, but overall, these stoves are the simplest to maintain, repair, and operate. Okay, now let's move on from the dirtiest to the perhaps cleanest and easiest to maintain as far as heat level is concerned, and that would be gas stoves. Gas being propane or much less commonly compressed natural gas or CNG. One of the strong advantages of a gas stove like a Force 10 or Dickinson's Cozy Cabin Heater is that they burn clean and it's relatively easy to control heat output with just a turn of a knob. But finding a place to refill the tank might be hard in many locations and then there's the need to store a fuel bottle somewhere and the fuel is explosive. I had strongly considered one of these heaters since I had propane on the boat already for the cook stove. But I could go through a whole 8 pound bottle of propane in about 2 days use. Well, that's continuous use. There would be lots of lugging around of propane tanks. Okay, so now let's look at the diesel stove option. Now, typically they don't burn as clean as gas stoves and for most stoves there will be some soot to clean up after in the burn pot and the stove pipe. But that depends upon how long and how often you burn. But most importantly, these stoves will be cleanest if you're careful in monitoring the air-fuel ratio and keeping the stove's internal parts clean. They can deliver a fairly consistent level of heat output, a lot better than solids, but well, maybe not as good as gas, but close to it. And because of diesel's widespread use in boating, the 
big advantage with this stove is that fuel can be found almost everywhere and it's not very volatile for me storage wasn't an issue since i already have a 30 gallon tank on this boat that serves the engine there are ways to burn cleaner with these stoves though I've read that using kerosene or cutting the diesel with some kerosene would substantially reduce the soot issue. But in my case, I'd have to store kerosene someplace and then find a place to sell it that sells it. Though, there is a small company in Norway called Arctic Blue Flame that makes a stove that uses a catalyst that they claim yields a, yields a no soot burn. But the installation requires an inflow pipe down from the deck and another hole course for the chimney. Reflex stoves require that too. Well, that might not be much of an issue for a larger boat with a good bit more deck and cabin space than I have on this small boat. But this airflow requirement is not far from when Dickinson has recommended in big bold letters in their manual. It says, an unrestricted airflow from outside must be available to the heater. These air intakes avert negative air pressure from happening in the cabin. Events like when wind gusts uh, swoop down on the deck, creating higher pressure outside than inside the boat, thus pushing smoke into the cabin. Also, by drawing in outside air into the combustion chamber, you avoid the loss of warm cabin air for burning. Actually, when you think about it, you think about the pressure issue and then the loss of warm cabin air. All stoves should have an external air feed to them, even wood stoves, although I'm not aware of one that does. At home, I plumbed my pellet stove, my wood pellet stove that way. Outside air is pulled in through this pipe at the back of the stove and into the stove's combustion chamber. Okay, I've decided to go with diesel. Next, what size stove? Well, I have a small boat, and the littlest stove I could find is Dickinson's SIG 100. I should note that the Arctic Blue Flame stove is pretty similar in size and heat output. Dickinson rates its stove at 5,000 BTU on the low setting. In near freezing temperatures, this little 1,000 watt electric space heater warms as well on this boat. And its BTU output is rated at about 4,000, so I figured the SIG 100 should be fine. And hopefully the higher heat settings will warm us on those windy days. I did consider a forced air or hydronic diesel heater such as Webesco's, since they can do a much better job heating the boat more evenly. But they consume a lot of electrical power, but they probably would be the better choice if I did have a larger boat. Okay, now where to put the heater? I checked installations on the very few other Pacific Seacraft Orions or other boats of similar small to medium size. It would seem best to position the stove as low and as functionally possible towards the cabin sole to help mix the cabin air while drawing in the coolest air and it should be centrally located uh, as far as heat reaching different living areas in the boat. So let's look over some options. One boat I had seen had a stove in the corner of the settee area of a Pacific Sea Craft Orion. While it's most out of the way, it's not centrally located, and it's harder to reach for adjustments and maintenance. I suppose if you're unlikely to use the stove much, this is a good place for it. It's pretty much out of the way. So that's all on the port side, and starboard side's pretty busy with the galley uh, pilot desk, so it's really not much, uh, well, not really a good option on the starboard side. So I'm, Back to looking on the port side. So I think the best option for me on this little boat is near the mast compression post. It's easier to reach, pretty much centrally located, but it's in the way of seating. I'll lose a seat near the table. However, I can still easily sit four people at this table and the table rotates so that you can get to the corner seat just by rotating the table out of the way. Another advantage of this location I later learned is that heat from the stove warms the bulkhead behind it and that in turn warms the head which is on the other side of the bulkhead. Okay so now what about the deck? Ideally the Charlie Noble or where the stovepipe runs up out of the cabin and in, onto the deck should be out of the way of boat handling tasks. And since I need at least four feet of stovepipe for draft, there will likely be an extension of stovepipe while this stove is being used, going up a ways from the deck. So now, what about the deck space? 
ideally a Charlie Noble or stovepipe coming up from below here in the cabin should be out of the way of boat handling tasks on deck. And since I need at least four feet of stovepipe for draft, it will likely be an extension of stovepipe going a ways up from the deck. I have to make sure that the boom, sail, and running rigging will be clear of the exhaust. Rough measurements indicate the best cabin location should work on deck. My choice, with the head cap placed near the mast step, should work out. It should give me enough room to work near the mast while also keeping clear of the way along the handrail. Both for someone grabbing onto a handrail, but also in case I want to later put down a track for a sliding stay sail um, control. Uh, like siding, sliding blocks. Okay, placement settled now. Now to start installation. One of my sons came out to help me. We read over Dickinson's installation instructions, which are pretty comprehensive. They tell us we need a 5 inch hole for the 3 inch diameter stovepipe, and that gives us an all around air gap of about 1 inch going through the deck. I ordered a piece of teak stock, which, because of its thickness, we had to cut down the size for the collar that we'll build going around the pipe and exiting up through the headliner at the cabin top and then another piece that will be the base for the Charlie Noble up there on deck. We rounded off three of the sides leaving the squarish uh, side to butt up against the bulkhead behind the stove or where the stove pipe will be. And for the base up on deck we'll make it a round donut all round and since there's some camber to the deck, we'll need to cut that teak with an angle on it so that the side closest midship will be a thinner thickness than the outer side that's closer to the cabin's crown and handrail. Put on three coats of varnish on the inside donut, and for the deck side donut, we put three coats of Cetol on, with the final coat being clear for UV protection. Back in the cabin, we measured over about 12 inches laterally or athwart ships from the compression post, meaning the minimal distance to a combustible wall, and we measured a distance from the center of the stove exhaust opening to the bulkhead behind it to which the stove would be mounted. Uh, but wait a minute, we messed up. We forgot to include this separately purchased mounting panel and standoffs that would be behind the stove. That mistake would become apparent later on as you'll see we're off by an inch by the time you consider the standoffs so now we took the donut with the flat side taped that to the cabin headliner and found the center point in that donut of where the stovepipe would go up through the cabin to the deck up above for reference we used the distance to the mast step compression post and the butterfly hatch in the cabin to estimate where the charlie noble would pop up on deck so we drilled a small hole at the center of that donut in the cabin, checked where it came out on deck. So the location looked good. So now with a pilot hole established up on the deck, it was time to bring out the big guns. We cut through about an eighth to three sixteenths inch thick layer of fiberglass and then three eighths of balsa core. And then on the way through that bottom layer of fiberglass, which again is about an eighth to three inch, inch thick uh, fiberglass, the arbor fitting on the cheap hole saw broke, so I had to run over to Home Depot for another five inch yeah. hole saw. I got an X-Acto knife to cut away the vinyl headliner and the three inch of foam between that and the top of the cabin. So now we have a five inch hole through the deck. We applied butyl tape to the underside of the deck teak donut and to the six screws to hold it down, making sure the thin side of the donut was towards the mast step. We screwed down the donut, which would be the base for the deck plate and for the three inch chimney pipe coming up through it. Back in the cabin, we assembled the stove, mounted it to the stainless steel backing panel, and then added fiberglass insulation behind the backing panel. Positioned the stove on the panel and mounted it to the bulkhead, allowing for enough room for clearance for the seat cushion under that. The protective gray plastic you see on here now covers shiny stainless steel, and that'll be removed later. 
Then we connected the three inch stovepipe with the first 12 inch long section having the barometric damper that maintains proper draft. Then we'll include a heat guard over this lower section to protect one from touching the hot stovepipe. Further up the stovepipe run, uh, we'll have to take care of that one inch offset difference I mentioned uh, that cropped up when we missed measured uh, and that will uh, have to be an adjustable double walled elbow. Dickinson doesn't have an adjustable elbow so this is a gas elbow with a stainless inside. Then we'll add the dress ring to cover over the air gap between the pipe and the overhead. Now back on top we screw down the deck fitting. Uh, we'll add a three foot section of stovepipe making the run from the top of the stove to the cap of the stovepipe five feet uh, well above the four foot requirement. I later learned what I really needed uh, from looking at forms is a insulated three foot section above deck of stovepipe and that uh, keeps the pipe warm and assists with draft. I did some experimenting with that. I tried first with a double double wall pipe I mean and uh, that didn't fit very well from what I could find. Um, so I wound up wrapping this section of stovepipe with a uh, half inch fiberglass ducting. I'm not sure if this will be my final solution. I'm pretty much experimenting with it. Next we need to mount the 12 volt fan control. I'll mount it to the bulkhead. That fans mostly to help start the stove by forcing a draft to get the fire pot up to a high enough temperature where fuel vaporizes and I turn it off. One more big item now to take care of. Where to put the heater's supply tank? I'll go with a gravity feed uh, from the tank to the stove to keep things simple. I don't want to give up more cabin space in the area where the heater is for a tank so I'll choose the cabinet behind the head on the other side of the bulkhead in other words from the stove. Uh, if I get spills I'd rather have it in the head uh, than out here in the cabin. Um, but my son who was a liveaborn on a Pearson 365 with this actual same heater had a day tank and he hated having to fill that day tank in the cabin. Worried about spill potential and then the odor and clean up. Uh, so he suggested strongly running a line from the main tank for the engine that's under the lazarette locker in my case over to a small one gallon heater tank that's over here in the head. So that became the plan. Okay as far as this location behind the head is that tank high enough? Well Dickinson uh, recommends at least a foot higher than the metering valve on the heater and I measured it looks closer to two feet. Is that too high? Uh, because Dickinson mentions that you can't have a flow pressure or fuel pressure higher than 4 psi on that metering valve. So what height is would I be at 4 psi? Uh, in other words the higher the tank goes the higher the pressure. So I know that from the hydrostatic equation that pressure equals density of a fluid times gravitational acceleration times height. And then using simple algebra I can solve for height. I'll throw the approximate solution up here briefly so as not to belabor this point. And stop the video here. Check out the calculation if you wish. This calculation shows that the tank should not be higher than 11 feet. Otherwise you'll need to get a regulator for fuel pressure. Well that certainly is not a problem for my boat but maybe on uh, well how about this one when your friend on the deck above you has the tank. Okay I bought a one gallon fuel tank from US Plastics. It's translucent so I can easily see how much fuel I have in the tank. I decided to make a brace to keep this uh, tank secure and also so that I can elevate it such that I can attach a hose fitting uh, to the bottom of the tank with a ball valve. Nothing in the boat square and the tank sure isn't so I had to use this contour gauge to get a good guess to create a template. Uh, and then this uh, cardboard template I shaped out uh, based on the contour uh, was um, sufficient enough to make a dry fit uh, going around the tank and then uh, I tried it out in the cabinet behind the head. 
And after a little tweaking, I had the shape I needed, and then I transferred it to three quarter inch plywood and then cut out the form of the tank or shape into the plywood. And uh, then the brace, of course, has got to meet the tolerances inside the shelf behind the head. And then after those cuts, I sanded and then sealed with uh, two, three coats of varnish. And then I secured those braces on the shelf in the cabinet with two pieces of aluminum L-bar. Next, I had the plumb uh, fuel. I used uh, this one quarter inch armored tubing and the inside wall is aluminum. And that ran from the main tank behind the set T to the heater's tank. Since the main tank now has to serve both my engine and the diesel heater, I installed a Y valve with ball valves to the line feeding the engine into the line going to the heater's tank. I will only open the heater line when I'm filling the heater tank so as not to lose my prime on the engine. Upstream of the Y I have a squeeze bulb that could prime either the line going to the fuel pump on the heater tank or the engine. Here behind the head is my day tank or diesel heater fuel tank. My braces are right here. And I have down here, uh, you might see these. It's an L here of uh, aluminum. That's a brace holding the uh, braces down to the shelf here behind the head. L that goes from the bottom of the tank. It's a half inch NPT thread uh, that I threaded into the tank here. Then I have a retainer ring to hold that in place. And that's sealed with uh, this um, make a gasket uh, cement that's good for fuel tanks. And that seals up that, that joint. Then, uh, so this is a uh, L or, um, or an elbow uh, that comes off here to a uh, half inch thread. And then here's a hose barb. Uh, going from half inch NPT to uh, this quarter inch fuel and then uh, line and then this goes to this ball valve right here and then that continues on to this fuel filter and then back here I convert from the quarter inch fuel line to this uh, quarter inch uh, aluminum guarded uh, line that goes uh, through the bulkhead behind here to the heater Coming in from, to the to this tank, uh, we first go through this fuel filter right here, and then into this fuel pump. This is the switch, the on-off switch that controls that fuel pump, and then that line comes up um, to this uh, L that's behind this cap and empties into this tank. So, uh, this is basically the on-off switch right here. Can you hear the pump work? And then that on-off switch is controlled back up in here by uh, these switches which go to a main line over to the 12 volt uh, switch or a breaker switch on the circuit panel. And out through here, this black line is the fuel line. I have the 12 volt red and black wires that go to the controller here for the fan. That back to the fuel line, we come up at connections on to this white ball valve, and uh, this is all stainless. Uh, a bit expensive on this versus regular or more common swage connectors, but I find these are pretty leak proof. And then inside here, we continue with uh, the spent tubing here that I had to make a profile to get around. Uh, the door uh, so there's enough space for this to come in another swage connector going into the metering valve here and this is what came with the stove these are regular swage connectors going out and then finally to the fire pot down there in the heater itself all right a couple more things here and close up I installed here a 14 gauge a uh, piece of sheet metal, it's aluminum uh, with an air gap to protect that bookcase. It's definitely closer than 12 inches, which is recommended minimum distance to this uh, heater flue or stovepipe. And then the other thing I added here is this 
smoke detector, uh, combination smoke detector and CO monitor. It's uh, uh, right in front of the head of V-Birth is over here. And then uh, the other things that are potentially emitting CO would be this propane gas cook stove. And then over there is the engine behind the steps. And that's a wrap of installing this SIG 100 Dickinson diesel heater on a small sailboat. And looking over briefly, are there still options? Next video, I'll have a short little thing on uh, starting this diesel stove and uh, some simple maintenance tips as well. Hope you join me for that. And then we'll go on to the third part of our Apostle Islands tour, uh, sailing up on Lake Superior. Uh, visiting some more beautiful islands up there and some uh, stunning scenery and some interesting turns on the way home. I hope you join me for that. Until then, we'll see you next time.